Sure, sure. Well, Marty, thanks for having me on. Uh, thanks for your kind words. Thanks for your kind words, Tyson. Uh, Tom, hello. I think we've met in the past. Uh, good so good to good to see you again. I'm sorry I'm not there in person. Would love to meet every one of you. Uh, my name's Dory Wiley, and I'm easy to find. <laughs> you type in Dory Wiley, and I think I'm the only one that comes up. So uh, uh, would would love to meet any and all of you at some point. Uh, I think topic of uh, I'm the president and CEO of, of Commerce Street Holdings. We have an investment bank. We have an investment firm, Commerce Street Investment Management. Uh, we have an OCIO business. We have a uh, $2 billion SBIC business. Uh, we've invested about a billion dollars in banks over the last 20 years. Uh, we do, uh, uh, we're actually in the retirement business too, if you imagine that. So uh, we're fastest growing uh, retirement business in the state of Texas. So uh, we do very well. So what I thought I would do is talk a little bit. Uh, Marty asked me to talk a little bit about adding alpha. Where are we seeing alpha? Right? We're all looking for that. And rather than just focus on alts, which I'll get there in a minute, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing and what we're seeing because we get a lot of calls from family offices going, hey, help me, help me. You know, and the first thing I want to do uh, I have low self-esteem, so I've got a CPA, a CVA, CFA, all these different letters, and and I seem to be in the uh, full-time uh, continuing ed business at times. But uh, I like to measure things. I like to benchmark, and I'm uh, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. First place I like to start is cash. I still see a lot of people not managing their cash correctly. They're getting three, four percent. They're not getting five. Manage your cash. It's free alpha. You know, if I were managing a stock portfolio for you and I was underperforming by 50 basis points or 100 basis points, you'd yell at me. So it, it, there's no risk in cash uh, or everything. There's no such thing as no risk, but there's less risk in cash. Manage your cash. And uh, it takes a little work, but it's worth the effort. Uh, free alpha and cash is great. And that's an over allocation right now, uh, at least in our book. Same thing with bonds. Bonds looks pretty easy. We all know they're going to cut. We don't know if it's going to be one cup. We don't know if it's going to be six cuts. We can debate that, talk about it for an hour or two, but we know they're going to cut and, and uh, uh, shouldn't be too much left on the risk of the upside of that. So there's no reason why not to extend past the index a little bit. Uh, if the index is running at six, I think, on the ag, then, you know, maybe hit seven or six and a half or something like that. Barbell the quality uh, with a bunch of T-bills and, and uh, three and four years and pop maybe a seven year in there. I just, I don't like taking a lot of risk, especially with the long end being manipulated on supply and demand, who's buying it and stuff, uh, particularly the 10 year. But I don't have a big problem with, if you got a long-term fund, get a barbell in with some 10 year, but we, we have preference for seven. And then uh, uh, you get the alpha in, in your active management with shorter durations and high yield and corporate. Uh, and get some good quality managers that outperform over the long term. And that that's there. And I think it's probably pretty easy to get that right now. We feel pretty confident about that. Stocks is always the toughest place to get alpha. It takes experts. I think it will be a stock picking year. I think there will be some alpha there. Uh, uh, very few people did 26% like the S&P 500. And most people, because they were under allocated the Magnificent 7. Well, guess what? You better allocate to the Magnificent 7 get it. It's not going away. And if you look at the earnings estimates, uh, they're being cut all across the board, except for what? Magnificent seven X Tesla, right? Do you want to cheat a little bit? Great. Overweight, uh, conservative, right? You make money on downside risk. And that's what we're worried about with the valuations. So go with the, with the big diversifieds, go, you know, have some uh, overweight Amazon, overweight Microsoft, overweight Apple, uh, underweight Tesla, underweight Google and Facebook, uh, even weight or overweight in the video AI is here to stay and you'll do just fine. Okay. But don't, don't do a big under allocation on magnificent seven or you're going to get left behind because their revenues are growing and it's not really growing, uh, as much in the rest. Uh, all the money was made at least the last six months or so in S and P 500 with margin management. All right. But there, uh, if you got experts in energy or banking, we can talk about banking. I think there's some alpha to be made there, but banks are going to run. They're not going to run hard. We've got continued uh, uh, deteriorating credit. Uh, so you got to be with banks to know how to do balance sheet management, to have margin expansion, to have good core deposits. Uh, uh, and, and then they can outperform other banks relatively. Uh, but I don't think banks are just going to run. There is some alpha there. 
uh, but you got to know what you're doing. And I, I suspect it's the same way in most all these sectors right now. Uh, I really like uh, good quality small caps right now. Uh, the risk for a recession seems to be a little bit lower, and that's in, indicative of some good opportunities in small caps. So low leverage, good margin, good companies uh, that have been undervalued. Try to, time to get in front of small caps before they run makes sense to me. Out of alts, right? Uh, looks like the dust is, should settle on some of the valuations of, of the alts. Uh, we've kind of gone through a lot of that in 2023. Uh, extensions, uh, tough market to raise money, tough money, uh, people stopping about investing money, uh, um, you know, particularly in private equity. You know, real estate's had some issues, valuation issues. Some of that should continue to play out in 2024. Private equity specifically, uh, we all love private equity. Uh, it's showing pretty good resiliency, you know, probably more than expected, given uh, particularly in the buyout space. Uh, but, uh, you know, not a real good exit year, right? Uh, you know, uh, terrible fundraising year. And that's creating some vintage year opportunities, right? So, uh, where are we focusing uh, in, in private equity, probably overweighting good quality uh, growth equity, underweighting buyouts, taking a lower risk and focusing on smaller, you know, we, we're really big in the SBIC space. Uh, uh, there's there's definitely alpha there. Uh, there's been a lot of pullback on investing there and there's some great opportunity, great multiples to be had. Uh, uh, the overweight, uh, the GP investing, we're really excited about some managers that we're back in and investing in there. Uh, so, uh, and when we, what we do is we're a merchant bank as well. Sometimes we'll invest and we'll go raise money uh, uh, along with them and co-investing type subs in either a fund or co-investing or whatever. So we like GP investing. We like secondary. We like small J curves. We like co-investing, all that kind of stuff, uh, just like everyone else does. But I'll, there should be some good vintage year opportunities in the next couple of years uh, in that area. Uh, we've even done some uh, uh, on the venture side, which I tend to be extremely cautious and scared of most of the time. Uh, on the venture side, cash flow, cash flow venture opportunities. You know where they're actually making making money on the EBITDA side. Uh, the valuations are decent because everybody ran from the space, right? So getting good high quality. Uh, you know, maybe not startup, but, you know, second, third, fourth round type stuff, um, you know, makes some sense to us. Private credit, everybody loves private credit right now. We do too, but we're credit folks. So we're careful. We like senior credit. We like first lien credit. We like asset based credit. And I like people that have been through a cycle. We got a whole bunch of people that have come from 08 and just been in the business the last 10 to 12, 15 years. That may not be enough. May not be enough. And that's not regulated, right? So coming out of the bank space, I got outside regulation, internal law, loan review, external loan review, state regulator, federal regulator, FDIC, audit. I mean, I got a lot of eyes and a lot of transparency. I don't get as much into private funds. And we all know the two and 20 model is not a perfect alignment of interest, right? That's a dissertation we can all read and talk about at some point. So be careful in private credit because if things did get ugly, right, then we can go back to stocks and make a pretty good market, pretty good uh, uh, argument that we got a 20, 30% allocation based on forward PEs. You know, things could get ugly, right? So don't, it's not off the table. I want to be in good private credit. The returns are high enough. I don't need to be greedy. Uh, you know, good high single digit, low double digit to mid, that's fine, great. It's like a bond substitute as well, and I get cash flow. I don't need to take a bunch of risk in my private credit because there's two. There's a lot of people in the space. There's a lot of people in the space. Hedge funds still seems to be brand name. You know, Millennium and, and some others. Uh, others are still having trouble making the uh, uh, two and twenty fees uh, pay for the low returns they have. So uh, we, we we like hedge funds. Uh, but we're sticking with good quality brand names. Real estate, you know, we're running away from office. We'll, we'll change that at some point. Vacancy rate still high. We still got a billion of square feet uh, uh, that'll be available by the end of the decade. It feels like the 80s all over again here in Dallas. Um, it's it's amazing how vacant a lot of these offices are. And there's a perf offices are and there's some permanent changes uh, going on uh, with the work habits and stuff. <coughs> 
we love industrial. Industrial's hanging in there very strong. Vacancy rate creep has come up to about 5.2% in the quarter four, but 15 year average is 6.4. We're in some managers that run in a 3%, good high quality credit. Uh, there's a shortage of new supply coming in. That's okay. We're in the opportunistic space where we're buying. And, and it's not hard to do opportunistic and industrial, right? You make sure there's not a leak. You make replace the tire on the rubber dock. Make sure the parking lot's paved. It's not, it's not expensive. Uh, so good presence and in industrial uh, still very attractive to us. We like medical office space as well. Um, we're not as big, even though people have been very successful on the housing uh, or, or let's call it single family ownership rents and stuff. That all, that's all doing very well. I'm not sure that I'm against it, but we just haven't really done a lot of that. We're still playing in select multifamily. That's opportunistic uh, debt problem. You know, we're trying to get a, uh, situations where we were able to buy, you know, non-auction type stuff, either from banks or people are liquidating and whatnot. We're getting some good opportunities there, good high quality uh, multifamily or, or, or high rise in, in, the, in, you know, the rich area of the cities and things like that. Uh, I think I hit most of the spaces there. I uh, tried to hit it pretty fast. Uh, Marty, is that kind of what you're looking for? Is that help? Yeah, that's great. I think we have a couple of questions here and hopefully we have some questions from the audience online as well, but, but um, you know, so I, I want to just get a perspective from you on, you know, so I read recently that is it Dallas or maybe Texas in general has m more finance jobs now than any other state except for New York. Yeah. We're number and two. I'm, I'm, and I just wanted to find out, you know, what, what are your thoughts about, you know, the groundwork, you know, anybody who goes to Dallas knows the phenomenal growth in and the very positive growth it's had. And I want to just get your perspective on, you know, the groundwork that's been laid to, to kind of be able to let all of that growth, you know, just you, you got to be, uh, uh, you know, I'm not trying to be a homer or anything. I mean, I would, I used to, th I thought I was rounding up when I said DFW was at 6 million uh, or so in, in population. And I found out yesterday we're at 8 million. I was like, wow. Wow. And about uh, 200, uh, 50, we're at in the Waco, the town, the size of Waco every year, <laughs> you know, 250,000. Wow. Yep. So, uh, yep. Yep. I mean, it's really growing. Uh, it's business friendly. Uh, uh, you know, we've got more fortune 500 companies based here than any other place in the country. Uh, uh, and, uh, we're not perfect, right? We're not perfect. We still are, are big cities. We can still run into, to some uh, problems, but you know, the Frisco's, the Las Colinas, the Irvings, they all do a good job of attracting people, partnering up with Dallas. But, but maybe as far as big cities go, uh, we're the prettiest house on the block on, in an ugly neighborhood, you know, <laughs> kind of like the U S is worldwide among countries, you know, I, sure. I, used to say, I used to say prettiest horse at the glue factory, but I think that sounds politically incorrect. So I, I won't, <laughs> I still think that's funny, but uh, anyway, <laughs> doing very, very well. We've added more jobs than anybody else in the country. Uh, the finance, It's amazing on the finance side because in the 80s, we had a really big finance center, particularly in banking, and it just got wrecked. And, and it right. never yep. Yep. Back. And when I read the article saying we were number two literally this week, I guess is what your reader or, or attendee is. Yep. Yep. Uh, I kind of smiled and said, wow, that was a long time coming, but it's it's nice to be back. Right, right. I think that there was a, I don't know if it's first bank of Texas that got acquired by Chase back in the day or one of those banks, but uh, yeah, it was really B interesting. Of A, B and of that, a, 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 a NCMB, you know, at that point, and then it rolled into B of A, uh, first Republic, yeah, fascinating. Uh, uh, Texas Commerce. So, well, you're thinking about Texas Commerce going to Chase, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I'm because as I said, yeah, for many years, Chase is one of my clients, and I was in Texas a lot doing uh, work with him. So, but um, so uh, quick question: so, so you had mentioned some issues with credit, uh, private credit. What, what's your worldview on that? Because I mean, a lot of people are really have really dived into private credit. You know, everybody's looking for yeah. What well, we do to alpha uh, a little, you know, some alpha opportunities is uh, uh, for smaller family offices and stuff is we run, for example, a private credit fund of funds and a private equity fund of funds, and they're concentrated six or seven names. We don't charge carry on it. We charge 45 basis points. It's extremely efficient. Nobody likes fees on fees. And, uh, we're in, in private credit, uh, 
you know, I'm, I, I like to tell people we don't manage money. We manage risk. If we do that right, then the money's there. And, and so in private credit, I, I do see risk. You know, it's a general term, kind of like hedge funds, right? Some of them are good, some of them aren't, uh, uh, or, or most anything. But if we stay in senior stretch or first lien or asset base, something something that we can kind of really understand, there's collateral, we can get to it. Yep. Somebody that's yep. got a workout mentality, somebody that's been through some cycles, people that have had actually collect, people have seen different rate cycles. You know, those things really, really uh, matter to me. And, uh, I think those are going to be differentiators because as others run into trouble, those are going to be the ones that are able to, uh, to gather those other assets up, right? Cause the other ones are going to need liquidity and they'll either get them from, uh, from banks or from other managers. But I think some other managers are going to run into trouble because if you, you know, we all know, we saw this in 08 when, when managers don't hit that hurdle and they can't get carry and they're not as motivated, uh, some managers will still work very hard for you because they're very honorable and very fiduciary oriented and others quit. When we yep, saw, yep. we saw a lot of people, they just quit and the model Absolutely. doesn't allow for that and uh, doesn't align yep. the incentives, you know, or uh, when, when I was on the board of TRS during that cycle, we, I think we did the first opportunistic debt allocation and stuff. And, and, w- and we got creative with people and redid their paperwork. And, you know, we want people incentivized, uh, and, um, uh, you know, the managers don't cause the crash, uh, but they don't help if they're not doing a good job, but if, if, if they're really good and they can manage it, you know, sometimes you have to adjust, adjust to give them an, an incentive. If you want them to be incentivized. Others so, so uh, so, people. you know, yesterday, yesterday we were talking about credit and, uh, a lot of people have been waiting on distressed, like to hit. And but nobody's seeing, you know, just that huge wave of distress happening. I'm not, I don't know if it's gonna happen in real estate or what, but I was hoping to get your worldview on why aren't we yeah, seeing I don't distress think yet? It's gonna be as bad as 08. I really don't. So there I, won't be that cycle. No, nah, I really don't see it. And I'm trying to be negative. I really do. But it starts with the banks. Banks underwrite better than they used to. And that's why this slow moving train wreck is really not been very fast and you're talking about five four five hundred basis points rising up and 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 lending it should have happened but you know banks weren't doing 90 percent ltv on construction like they were in 08 they were doing 50 to 60 to begin with <laughs> and now they're right, going down right, yeah. and so uh I, I, that left a lot of room for what for the cr- private credit guys to be a little more conservative in their underwriting or otherwise they'd have had to be more aggressive so uh, I just think the underwriting is much better. Now, the banks have made mistakes in managing their balance sheets and their capital, but credit, they've done a good job. And of the four banks, three banks went under and one kind of did, you know, with Silvergate. Uh, none of them were credit issues. I yeah, got really interesting. Question, Tyson, you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. You talk about a worldview, and uh, we used to love the Chinese, and now I'm not such great fans of them speaking kind of on a very gut level. Um, and it was a great place to invest for a while, but now it looks like one of the biggest uh, bubbles and bubbles in real estate. And I wanted, you said you got a worldview. What's your take on what's going over on over there? I mean, we may not be having a huge problem, but you know, there are arguments uh, uh, that suggest Things could get real nasty for them. Well, what's your take? Well, they've been nasty, right? They were down 20% two years ago and then uh, to a year ago and then, and then this year. And they're not done yet. Uh, so w- where I have a problem is, is I like transparency and I like good information. So I've never been a real big investor in China to begin with because they don't have the same accounting rules we do. And, and if I look at their banks, you know, the banks are just lending like crazy and they weren't structured very well. Now their government back, but you know, they were hot, hot as a pistol. And, and, uh, that scared me, you know, so I haven't been, I've always, I've been under allocating China all the way. That doesn't mean that there's not going to be an opportunity there, but I am not, unless I can get good, clear transparency, it's tough. Uh, they've got a different value system or at least the uh, government does, uh, then, then, uh, that doesn't maybe align with, uh, the investing values that we have over here. 
uh, it may does for some people may it may for some people, but it doesn't doesn't with a lot of people that I know. So I'm extremely cautious and uh, will not be a first mover on China. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, especially when you consider the regulatory environment there. So I mean, we've had people for more than 25 years coming to us about China. First, it was venture capital, then it was private equity, and it was the public markets. And no, nobody ever explained how you actually got your money out of China, um, So uh, even if you made profit. So it's it's, uh, it's you know it's an interesting situation. So I think people should always consider what's the, the legal – uh, regime that's in another country. So, um, any other questions, comments for Dory? Uh, and so, Dory, where do you think public equities will be at the end of the year? Private equity, public public equities. Oh, public equity. The market. Well, forty eight hundred yeah. right now is where we were two years ago, right? Uh, I don't think anybody was forecasting a twenty six. I'm talking about the S P five hundred, of course. I don't think anyone forecasted a twenty six percent gain. Uh, this year, uh, I certainly wouldn't forecast it this year. I don't see that. I see uh, earnings estimates uh, being cut at a faster rate uh, than usual right now. Uh, I don't see a recession, so I see us muddling up and down, up and down. It's an election year. Uh, you know, there'll probably be either a real geopolitical event or maybe some manufactured ones around here. Uh, so I, I just kind of see us all over the place. I wouldn't see us, you know, much more above 5,000, you know, maybe a little yeah, bit. So, so you, and you're a big fan of the Magnificent Seven, but really many of the other stocks really aren't doing that great. Yeah. The other companies. Yeah. yeah Interesting. I'm under, I'm yeah, under I, I've heard that opinion a lot. Yeah. I would under allocate portfolio wise. We're under allocating the stocks. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, fantastic. Great job, Dory. Fantastic. Uh, just to make you a little hand here. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's move to Tom O'Donnell. I've actually known Tom for, gosh, 10 or 15 years, and uh, Tom's had a storied past, um, and he's worked for a hedge fund for, for the last few years, and uh, they had a pretty sensational year this year. So, Tom, tell us about your worldview and about the hedge fund that you're working for and, and what what was the uh, magic uh, ingredients that you did to um, have a success this year? Yeah, well, just uh, thank you, Marty, for having me. And uh, for, back, for background purposes, uh, my career started in 1987, working for one of the larger public pension funds in the U.S., the Virginia Retirement System. And uh, the portfolio started out a lot of fixed income, a little bit of equities and real estate. And in the roughly 10 years I was there, we were uh, pioneers into alternatives. So, but starting in 87, if you start your investment career in 87, Black Monday, you lose 22% in a day, you, you start to pay closer attention to downside risk in the stock market. So my career has been fueled by that. My uh, most senior positions at the Virginia Retirement System were running global equity, liquid alternatives, long short equity. We had total return swaps uh, and also managed futures. We were one of the largest investors in CTAs uh, in uh, May of 91. So with that as a background, and I was encouraged to you to share a few slides, uh, I'm going to do that hopefully. You'll be able to see this one second. Can your audience uh, see this, uh, Marty? Yes. That's yes. okay. good. Okay, let me make, see if I can get that to disappear. Okay, hopefully that toolbar will disappear in a second. Um, okay, so anyway, so we're talking about alternative alpha strategies. The firm that I work for is 3D Capital Management. I joined the firm about five or six years ago after I met the, the founder of 3D Capital, who claimed to be a CTA. So he claims to be a commodity trading advisor. He, I asked him, well, what markets do you trade? Because most CTAs trade, you know, on average 60 to 80 markets, stocks, bonds, currencies, commodities. He said, well, I only trade the E-mini S&P futures contract. Okay, so remember my background, global equities, managed futures. I'm not thinking about 3D through the uh, managed futures lend. I'm thinking of them more as an equity manager. And then he really surprised me. He said, and I'm primarily short only. In my career, the hardest alpha to find has been this one down here. This is just a chart on the left that's showing the daily returns in the S&P back to 2000. 
There have been a little over 3,000 positive days, 2,000 negative days, but it's these red bars that cause all of the pain. You know, if we got into a conversation about definitions of risk, you know, you hear people throw out VAR, standard deviation. Uh, I have a tendency to simply focus on the difference between positive numbers and negative numbers and max drawdown. So these red bars are the problem. And the question is, how do we best manage those? Uh, back to 87, we were uh, heavily involved in modern portfolio theory you know, spread your eggs amongst as many baskets, non-correlated baskets as possible. But I still ran global equities and we weren't getting out of equity. So I also had to think about how to protect the eggs that are in the equity market basket and remain in the equity market basket. The other chart that many of you have likely seen in your careers is this one on the top. The index fund providers and a lot of the long only equity managers have a tendency to produce this chart with just two lines. It's the blue line, buy and hold, versus what happens if you miss the 20 best days. I was presented with that chart back when I was an allocator at the pension fund, and immediately my brain just wanted a more comprehensive picture. So when you run the graph saying, well, what, what about if I'd missed the 20 worst days? You can see the magnitude. Clearly, missing the best days and missing the worst days has a tremendous impact on your results. But I do believe that it's the downside risk. It's these, you know, uh, retracements or declines in the stock market that cause the most pain. The other thing that's interesting about the stock market is risk happens fast in the stock market. Okay, um, we, we've heard, all perhaps heard the expression, the stock market takes the escalator up, but the elevator down. And this is just some recent history of the S&P 500. Here in 2018, four months of S&P 500 profits disappear in 10 days. Six months of profits disappear in three months. 14 months of profits disappear in five weeks. Then we have the pandemic. Then two years of profits disappear in, uh, or cut in half rather in 10 months, so on and so forth. So the one thing I don't like, uh, hopefully Marty will not ask me where I think the S&P will be at the end of the year, because I've never felt comfortable making any forecasts of that nature. What I do feel comfortable saying, because it's proven true my entire career, is that the stock market will always move in two directions, and I encourage investors to be prepared for it. I do have a question, Tom. Yes, please. What What are the twenty worst days? Is there seasonality involved? So that I, I have. So this is an abbreviated presentation. I was asked to keep it condensed to just five slides. Um, in my the expanded presentation, I actually have all of those uh, twenty best and worst days on a separate slide. Um, but they do they. It's not so much seasonality. They just tend to be at those inflection points where we're going, you know, from a into a bear market, for instance. The other interesting thing about bear markets is often you'll see the greatest rallies occurring also in a bear market. So that concept of the market constantly moving in two directions is present. Um, there's no question that obviously being a long-term investor in the stock market, um, it, it goes up two thirds to three quarters of the time. The data proves that, but it's these, these large swings and most importantly, the red arrows. So I've always you know, been very interested in unique sources of stock market alpha, but also ways to mitigate that risk and smooth out the equity curve. And that brings Great. me to um, 3D Capital's uh, program called 3D Bull Bear. So 3D has this 16 year history of generating short side alpha in an S&P program. And then they also have a slightly shorter period time period of generating long side alpha, but always in separate programs. And so the way we used to cater to the client was to say, well, which one are you missing? And oftentimes when the market was showing, you know, a weakness, the investor would be more interested in the short side alpha program. Uh, other times when the market was rallying, the investor would be more interested in the long side alpha program. So early last year, 
for the first time, what 3D decided to do was we decided to combine these two sources of alpha in one program, thereby creating an absolute return program that uh, takes advantage of both rallies and declines in the S&P, and it uh, alleviates the decision making for the investor. Uh, so think of it like an automobile. You, you've got the gas pedal, that's the long side alpha, and you also now have the brake pedal, which is the uh, short side alpha. This is an absolute return program. It is systematic. It's a rules-based system. It operates in a very short-term window. <clears throat> it is long short, but it involves no stock selection. So when I was allocating to the long short equity space beginning in 1990 and some of the market neutral strategies, those managers were making money by ranking stocks. Most overvalued to undervalued go long, the undervalued stocks go short, the overvalued stocks. Security selection, there were costs involved in that. They had to pay for the shares they borrowed. They had to pay for leverage if they uh, happened to employ any. The only instrument 3D Bullbear uses is the E-mini S&P futures contract. It's the most, it's the most liquid um, uh, in, index uh, future on the CME group, the, which is the largest futures exchange in the world. But it, it literally is the representation of the S&P 500 index. So we're an active absolute strategy using an index fund to take advantage of the daily direction in the S&P. Now, why the E-mini S&P? Ask yourself, what is the best instrument to manage stock market risk? Occasionally, when I've had these conversations, somebody will say gold, or they'll throw out some other asset class. But the reality is, is those other asset classes, gold as an example, also moves in two directions. So all of these asset classes constantly moving in two directions. Um, you know, when you add gold, you're introducing gold risk to the portfolio. And I think you're hoping that when the stock market goes down, gold will go up. But one of the phenomenons that seems to be in play, uh, particularly over the last decade, is this concept called risk on, risk off. So in a risk on environment, investors across the globe seem to be buying stocks and other risky assets. And in a risk off environment, they're selling stocks and other risky assets. And so we tend to see correlations amongst non-correlated assets increase uh, during periods when you would hope that the diversification would be working the most. The only the other thing I will mention about the E-mini S&P, you recognize this is a short term strategy. The strategy only holds an overnight position approximately 10 percent of the time. So for a taxable investor, you might be thinking, oh, it's short term, so it's got a disadvantaged tax treatment. It actually doesn't. You get the preferential tax treatment afforded by the IRS with this product because of that instrument. The futures contract has a 60-40 tax treatment, 60% long-term capital gains, 40% short-term. I'm a big believer um, <clears throat> whenever a manager, used to, uh, when I was an allocator and they would tell me a story how they generate alpha, I would uh, always want to get my hands on the performance attribution because whatever they were claiming to do, if I could isolate in a performance attribution where those sources of alpha were showing up, um, I could then explain it to my colleagues, the board, the committee, and perhaps for some of the family offices, if you ever had to explain a strategy to a family member that's not an investment professional. I think this is important. 3D Bull Bear is, uses state-of-the-art pattern recognition tools. So we have these rules. I do not have that information in this presentation, but I'd be happy to discuss the, any, any of that with you later if somebody wants to reach out. But we're going to look at March of 2023, the Silicon Valley Bank collapse. This is the S&P chart on the left. That's its actual price activity. It started the month right out of the gate, up 4%. And then, thanks to this one news announcement, the S&P experienced a 7% decline and an 8% rally all in the same month. On the right-hand side, you see bull bear nimble to the message of the market. That's what it is supposed to do. It is supposed to identify rallies and declines and participate on whichever side it identifies um, either strength or weakness. You can see the performance attribution. The bull signals are, are obviously the long side alpha. The bear signals are the short side alpha. 
you'll see on at least two days during that month, there was no trading. We consider not trading also an active position because occasionally the chart patterns are choppy and sideways and bull bear is designed to take advantage of directional volatility, not choppy or sideways. So this is just one example in the month, but in this particular month, because it depicts uh, the strength of bull bear so well, you can see that it finished the month up 9.7% uh, while the S&P finished the month up about 3.67%. Now, mind you, this information that I'm showing in this presentation is gross of 3D's fees. And the reason it's gross is because I felt it was important to show the performance attribution when you, um, and the only way for me to do that was to take the gross returns from our trading models. The final slide here is, again, 16 years of success delivering long and short side alpha finally made available in one program. This is how the program did for the whole year last year, beginning in March when we finally got the clients converted over <coughs> to the program. So prior to this, we had we had investors in the long only and we had investors in the short only S&P programs. And then by March of 2023, we began to convert them over. So this is the live track record. This once again is gross of fees. 3D bull bear last year was up gross of fees, 37.1. The net return was 29.7. Using just the gross return though, you might expect with a stock market that was up significantly last year, Dory mentioned a 26% <coughs> return. It was nearly 22% uh, since March when bull bear, uh, when those models were combined. But notice the short side alpha. This was the part in my career that I always struggled to find. It seemed like every manager in the long short space that I would allocate to would generate fairly significant uh, long side alpha, but their short side alpha was primarily a <clears throat> risk mitigator. It would make the um, standard deviation go down and then the sharp ratio would go up, but the overall or absolute return wouldn't be benefiting from taking advantage of a stock market moving in two directions. Bull bear is different in that regard because it once again, bull bear involves no stock selection. Bull bear is strictly uh, taking advantage of pattern recognition and uh, tr basically trend following the um, S and P five hundred index. But you can see here, there, hey, Tom, the Tom there was there was a question about: um, Are you guys using any leverage in your strategy? Yes, this most of our clients, because it's the E-mini S&P futures contract, the CME uh, margin requirement for trading uh, one e e uh, of those contracts is five, roughly 5%. So what our clients have a tendency to do is they would tend to fund their accounts. They, they have all they all of them have separately managed accounts. We trade in a block order and we give the trades up respectively to the clients, uh, different accounts. They have daily liquidity, complete transparency, uh, and most importantly, investor control. So if the investor wanted to dial up or down using leverage their particular bull bear program, uh, we allow them to do that. But th this example here is a 25% funded account. So if for instance, um, you know, it was a $10 million account, it's uh, cash funded with 2.5 million. The, uh, Dory mentioned about cash, couldn't agree more. These, these returns, cash is such a great thing uh, now that we've got uh, interest rates back up to a more reasonable level. So none of our bull bear returns include interest income. Okay, we manage stock market risk, but we encourage and our clients seek to take advantage of generating interest income on the cash they deposit in the bull bear account. And so many of the FCMs, that's a futures commission merchant, those are the custodians of a futures account. A number of them have started paying interest income on the cash deposits. And that is just another source of return to an investor investing in bull bear. But yes, this is uh, roughly a 20, this is a 25% funded exposure. And um you know, we have, we have simulations for this going back. The drawdown in this 25% funded account is less than half of what the S&P's drawdown has been since uh, January of 2000. <clears throat> so 
this uh so back to uh predictions um I, I have a tendency, I, I mean, I agree with Dory. I do believe that the stock market is going to continue to move in two directions. Where it will finish the year, I'm not sure. Whether it'll be moving in two directions and trending down, moving in two directions and trending <clears throat> up. But the fact that we all agree that the stock market, I think we all agree, that the stock market will forever move in two directions. Uh, you know, that's where I think the strength in 3D bull bear is, is that it exists to take advantage of that reality. And uh, with that and what time remains, I'll I'll pause. Any questions, folks? Can you go back to that slide, which has the monthlies? With uh, this one here? Uh, right there, yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. So so what's the signal that, uh, so you guys will, you know, and and you you invest fractionally based on the signal where the market the general market is going. Yeah. So the other interesting thing about what Bull Bear does, even though it's an S and P strategy, the founder of the firm Eric Dugan uh, got his start over thirty years ago working for Monroe Trout. Monroe Trout is a very successful, you know, legendary hedge fund manager. He's featured in uh, Jack Schwager's book New Market Wizards. So what's interesting about Bull Bear? as compared to other equity market strategies is bull bear actually is a uses a global macro approach okay the trading eric did for monroe trout was global macro and we're using global markets so we're using markets in asia europe and the us and the us and the s&p's own price activity that's how our rules identify strength and weakness in the s&p Everyone who turns on their television in the morning and looks at a financial channel, you'll see that little ticker at the bottom, right? And the first markets to open every day are in Asia. If Asia is showing red, this is just a naive, simple example. If Asia is showing red, and then when Europe opens, <coughs> Europe is showing red, what do you think might happen in the S&P? Think about this global relay race. Think about how risk is being moved around the globe and think about a baton being handed. Well, in the event that Asia is, is suffering and then it hands the baton to Europe and they're suffering and risk follows risk into the US and the US suffers, yeah, there would be a downward trend occurring and we would uh, likely, if we got a signal, participate. The, the system is trailing and scaling. We don't put a full position size on in the beginning. You know, sure. Make, There's one last question here. Do you it. have, we've got two questions here. One is, do you have back simulations to black swan events? Yes, actually we have a, um, it's interesting. So this 16 year history, uh, the way Eric Dugan, again, the founder of 3D, the way he beta tested this uh, kind of trial basis was a live portfolio in 2008. So we actually have an S&P live track record in 2008. It's a long only strategy at that point in time. And every time the system generated a signal, he just went to cash. Well, that long only strategy in 2008, when the S&P was down 37%, this is an actual track record. It was up 3.3 in 2008. So- uh, we, And we, we have one more question here? Yes. Two more questions, Arun? Yeah. What's the actual average hold period for each trade? Uh, most of the trading occurs in a five hour window. And only 10% okay. of the time, only 10% of the time do we hold an overnight position. Can Tom expand on the absence of treatment that you just remarked about? Does he market this as a tax efficient strategy? Can you expand on after tax treatment? Is it market efficient? Is it tax efficient? Well, I uh, if you if you see a, a, a strategy that's trading primarily in a five hour window you know, uh, daily, um, you would assume that it, all of the uh, returns generated would be short term, but the instrument we're using, the instrument is the E-mini S&P futures contract. And I've got literature on this. If anybody emails me, I'd be happy to send the literature to you, but it gets 60, 40 tax treatment by virtue of the underlying instrument. So 60% long-term capital gains, 40% short-term capital gains. Interesting. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, that's Tom, really great and revelatory. So, thank you so much. I'm glad to see a hedge fund is doing great. So, fantastic. Yes, thank you. Let's jump to Tyson Halsey. Tyson's been with us for many years now, and uh, we always uh, love hearing your point of view and um, your fundamental perspective. Tyson? Thanks, Marty. I'm going to share a screen, hopefully. Let's see here. And let's try this. Does everyone see that? Looks nice. Okay, so uh, my name is Tyson Halsey. I'm going to talk about alternative alpha strategies for 2024. Um, I'm going to talk about a few macro insights and a couple strategies. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the spoiler alert is, Dory will disagree with me, but I'm, this is what makes for a panel. I think the Magnificent Seven are in a bubble. Um, and I also think that there is a risk in terms of inflation, which the market has not really grasped. Uh, and that creates some real problems uh, broadly for both stocks and bonds. So I think other stuff makes sense. So I definitely agree with the idea that having a lot more cash makes sense. And in terms of strategies, I'm going to talk about a concept, the great rotation also gold and some option strategy ideas I have. But to start with the stock market, um, there is a concept called the Fed model or the risk premium model. And you look at the cash flows of the S&P 500 compared to the yield of the 10-year U.S. Treasury, and that differential is ranked. And what's nice about it is it gives a broader macro perspective because at the end of the day, you can either invest in stocks or you can invest in bonds. So it could be the S&P 500 or it could be 10-year treasuries. And if the yield, the, the, the flip side of the PE, the earnings yield on the S&P 500 is considerably more than the 10-year U.S. Treasury, that's a better investment. And uh, right now, the risk premium on the S&P 500 is 1%. And um, that's pretty low. The last time, I'm not sure whether you can see my little arrow, we were down at 1% was in 2002 as the, 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 the tech bubble was uh, still winding down. And so we, so if you ask me, we're priced for perfection. Stocks are not cheap. I would not be eager to invest in them. Doesn't mean that they're bad, but I think that you have some real risks in terms of where the market is priced. There is an assumption that there's going to be a soft landing. Earnings will not roll over. However, we've, uh, if we have a, a real recession, they will roll over and things will get ugly for the S&P. The other risk is you know, the 10-year U.S. Treasury is yielding 4%. Well, that, that's nice, it's certainly better than a half percent where it was four years ago, but inflation's about 3%, so you're really not getting paid all that much on a real basis. And frankly, I don't buy the belief that inflation is going to drop back down to 2% or lower. And so I don't like owning treasuries 10 years because there is that risk. That things will back up. So I would just, if I'm going to have bonds, I'd keep a much shorter duration to that. The thought on the Magnificent Seven is, and this, I, I think these guys do great work. My my thinking is not just copying theirs. It isn't. I, I've, I've seen bubbles. I've made monies on bubbles on both sides. Um, I ran a tech hedge fund in uh, 1999 and got out at the top. But I did get back in, because, which is one of the reasons I'm more bearish, because uh, I got back in about a year and a half afterward and then watched the NASDAQ go down 83%. Um, so this is just a, a picture of the, the, the Magnificent Seven, and they're showing the, uh, the top 10 mega cap tech stocks. And I think that they're... I, I think that they have been beneficiaries of two factors. One 
extraordinarily low, artificially low interest rates, courtesy of our government, the Fed, the Treasury, and those low rates are gone. That was then, it was to get us out of the 2008 financial crisis, uh, the, the COVID crisis, but now interest rates are back four or five percent, and um, that is not driving, I think, long duration large cap equities. And um, I also think that we have a risk in terms of inflation. I don't think that we can continue to count on an accommodative Fed. Everyone's priced in for that, for more cuts, and maybe we will. But uh, another case against the Magnificent Seven is that the their size has grown so substantial that they virtually cannot continue to grow. And you can get some debate, and very good one from Dory, but, you know, uh, you have to start to wonder about why, you know, Apple has such a great uh, valuation <laughs> and its uh, revenues are starting to decline. Um Another thought that I have that I think is very important, one of my friends, Robert Levin, he had worked for Paul Tudor Jones and for um, Lewis Bacon, and he was one of their uh, strategists. And, you know, he talked about historical analogs. And I, I thought that that concept resonated, and particularly as it relates to an inflationary cycle. And so we all remember the 1970s. Nobody was making great money in stocks. They're making it all in commodities. And if you at that time understood kind of what an inflationary cycle looked like, maybe you don't want to be so much in stocks. And that's what my belief is today. We had another opportunity to observe an inflationary cycle from about 1999 to 2011, or maybe 2000 to 2008. But during that period, gold did incredibly well. Oil prices went way up, then the stock market crashed twice. So getting away from the S&P 500 made a lot of sense. And we are clearly absolutely in an inflationary environment. It's driven by higher energy prices. It's driven by supply issues. It's driven by what I might suggest is really poor Federal Reserve decision making, their decision that, you know, they could keep that inflation would be transitory and they just didn't have to worry about things. And um, they blew it. They're wrong. But let's take a look uh, about the relationship between inflation or commodities and uh, financials. And I like to look at a ratio of the CRB index versus the S&P. And basically, when you are in an inflationary cycle, as I mentioned, you don't want to be in the, the S&P when you're in inflation, such as from the bubble uh, till the financial crisis, then you wanted to be more into the golds and oil and the like. Uh, you did not want to be in the S&P. But the flip side occurred after the great financial crisis crisis. You got into the S&P at 666 and, uh, you know, stayed long there and you bought the Qs and you bought the Magnificent Seven and you made just an enormous amount of money. I believe that ratio is reversing. We saw it decline until it reversed here. And I think that now we have higher inflation. And uh, though we've had a nice pullback, a very significant pullback in commodity prices, I expect that they'll continue to do uh, do well and the S&P will fade. I think a lot of it has to do with the lack of CapEx in the energy space, but also in the minerals and mining space. So uh, one of the big thoughts that I have is that 40 years of declining interest rates, which has driven the stock market, which has then driven um, capitalization weighted indices, really has pushed these large cap growth names uh, excessively. I think that we're in a position where, lo and behold, we're going to start to see gold do very well. It will be a better allocation. And uh, I think you'll see uh, strength in energy, mining, and metals. So just to, I think, you know, I'll, I'll read something that says, oh, well, gold will go to 2400. And, you know, gold's around 2000. And to me, big what? 
my perspective or the perspective that I think jumps off the page here is actually if you're in an inflationary environment, that the types of moves that you have had during those environments, the 70s, gold went from 35 to 677. Gold went up 1,800%. Gold went up 18-fold. And then more recently, from 2000 or 99 till 2011, it went up 600%, 6x. Well, right now, where we've almost doubled. But if you ask me, I don't see why 3,000 or 4,000 couldn't be uh, there. I think that people may say, well, I'm not so comfortable with cryptocurrencies or, you know, all the geopolitical, the wars, all that sort of stuff. It's, you know, there's there's a lot of appeal to gold. And frankly, if uh, stocks and bonds aren't doing well, people may start to add to it. And by virtue of the fact that uh, the way cap weighting uh rankings uh, drove a lot of these large cap stocks. I think that, you know, risk adjusted uh, return strategies will drive more and more allocations into gold. And I think that that is a place where good money and potentially great money can be made. Um, I'm going to take that argument and extend it here also to energy and to minerals and mining and uh, point out again, how during these periods there, if you catch them properly, the potential for significant alpha is enormous. I mean, if you look from 1999 to 2008, the energy index was annualizing compounded annual growth rate of 22% based on the XLA. And you compare that against the triple Qs, which during that same period were down 3%. Well, that would be a just from a sector reallocation standpoint, an alpha of 25% annualized per year. So if you do actually catch that rotation properly, there's, there's great potential. I think that we are just coming off a period of extraordinarily strong performance here in the queues since 2009, almost 15 years at 20% compounded annual growth rates. You compare that to energy and you compare that to the uh, XME, which is the minerals mining uh, ETF, those have been largely flat, have underperformed. There has been a lack of capital investment in this area. And frankly, I think if we have some inflation and the economy does not roll over, you could really see some substantial return um, in, in those areas. Um, the last concept um, I won a investment contest in 1992. I've run a couple of hedge funds, employing options. I worked on the floor of the New York Futures Exchange in 1985, like okay, 85 to 85, but it was 85 to 86. Um, but uh, one of the things that I came to understand, I studied these the, the models, Black, Scholes, Fisher, Black, Binomial. And the, the one thing that really stood out is none of these things use earnings. I mean, as a CFA or anybody looking or thinking about uh, asset values when it relates to equities, it's well, what's a PE and what's the earnings? <laughs> and if you're going to think long term about investing and you're not including uh, the earnings growth, you've got some real mispricing uh, potential and options. And one of my one of one of and my observation is that long term options are undervalued, whereas short term ones are overvalued. And simply because if you find a great if you find an outperforming stock, a great growing franchise, such as the Magnificent Seven, those that's where you want to be. My bet right now is I think if we get the secular rotation into more commodity type names. You want to be in all the those major energy material mining names with long term options, and you can add significantly to your alpha. Um, Tasting about five minutes, and we're wrapping up. On the flip side, um, selling short term options is a way. There, there's something inherently options most people lose money with. Why? Because they use it as, oh, I think something's going to happen and they're going to use their gut and then they're going to go 
buy call options because of what they heard at the cocktail party last night. But um, that's a loser's game. You have time decay, which really accelerates as you approach your expiration date. So the value of something that's two weeks out versus one week, you'll lose half your time. So you can sell short-term call options against a long-term call position and simply accumulate that time decay. And you can balance or you can combine those strategies of owning cheap long-term calls and selling call options uh, and create a very uh, compelling strategy, particularly when you bring in stock selection, if you, of course, are correct in your stock picking. Um, so this is me. I've been quoted in a few places, won this contest. So you can read me on Seeking Alpha. And I'd point out one thing that I didn't mention, but it's worthwhile as it relates to this. If you go to my website or Seeking Alpha, you can see that in March of 2020, I wrote a, a piece called uh, irrational negativity. And why? Because the risk premium at that point was six. And if you bought at the bottom, you had around six in 2008 and also around 2000 and or 2009, also around 2012, 13. So I'm a, I really like the risk premium model. Um, but I believe that what is unique about, about what's going on in the market is that we have inflation and uh, I think that outperformance is going to be uh, realized by being able to capitalize on that that different f fundamental factor from the one that we have been living with for a long time, which basically says the market always goes up and don't worry about it. Uh, so that's that's it. I'll take any questions. So Tyson, can I summarize it? So you're yes. saying you agree with Dorian that the, the market's going to move side to side this year. But you're not so much in agreement on the Magnificent Seven. You think they're overinflated. Uh, but now so you're a big believer in commodity cycles. But I mean, it seems like commodities have made a move. But at the same time, the cost of oil has declined greatly. You know, and I anticipate that oil is going to be cheap through the election. I think, right? It so I'm not so sure. I agree with your inflation point of view. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, and oils, I just read a good piece on oil and that basically oil went broadly defined to include, you know, uh, hydrocarbon liquids such as uh, uh, LPGs and things along those lines. Uh, we have tons of it. So, you know, oil may not really prove to be it, but I think that there has been a lack of investment in a lot of the, the mining. And if you think about building out a new green infrastructure, there's enormous need for a lot of these mining. And I think that those companies should do well. But commodities and commodity stocks actually have done lousy for 18 months. But for about two and a half years, they were on fire. And I wouldn't be surprised to see that reverse. And I think a lot of people want to see which way the, the, the global economy is going to go. But yeah, I think you've got my summary correct, Mark. Okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm looking forward to all, all of your guys' results uh, at this time next year. And we'll see what played out. So, and again, uh, Dory, we'll see you in Austin when we're there. And um, Tom, great to see you again. And Tyson, we'll see you later on today. So thanks so much.